The Second Crusade was launched in December 1145. It was designed to recover the county of Edessa, lost to the Muslim warlord Zengi the previous year. The Second Crusade stretched across expeditions to the Holy Land, to Iberia and to the Baltic, and in many ways was a complete failure. But that doesn't mean that there are not elements of interest within it. And in fact, one aspect of it was an extraordinary success, and that was recruitment. And I think there's a number of reasons why that was the case, not least the preaching of Pope Eugenius III and St. Bernard of Clairvaux. And we're very lucky to have the preaching bull, as it's called, of Eugenius III, and some of Bernard's letters that we can look at and help to understand why they were so successful in drawing people to this enterprise. Eugenius III wrote this bull called Quantum Pride Cassoris in late 1145, early 1146. It starts by invoking the memory of early crusaders. We're 50 years after the first crusade by now, and the memory of the achievement, surely the divinely blessed achievement of the first crusaders in recovering Jerusalem has become fully embedded in the culture of Western Christendom. The heroes, Godfrey of Bouillon, Bohemond of Antioch, Raymond of Saint-Gilles, Chroniclers write, we don't need the heroes of old anymore. We don't need Hector, Achilles and Roland. We have our own heroes, men that you knew or are related to. And Eugenius III taps into that very cleverly in his preaching. When he says, look, these men in the past strove, they gave up their lives, they prepared to lose their lives in recovery of the Holy Land. Now, this generation, you lot, Shame on you if you let that great legacy go. So he emotionally boxes them into a corner. It's quite a, it's a calculating move by him, but it's drawing upon this past, which is so much of the culture of the time. He also, in some ways, in a, in a, in a way that First Crusade texts do, he draws out the atrocities committed by the Muslims or said to be committed by the Muslims against the Christians of the Near East. He says that the French are a chosen people as Urban II did in 1095, you are the people who can rescue the situation. He talks about vengeance, and he talks about the remission of sins, the spiritual reward that you will get as a crusader. There's another interesting technique that he employs in this document, and that's repetition. He talks about Urban three times. He talks about remission of sins three times. And I think it's because it's a piece that's meant to be read out loud. And if you're in a, a crowded market square or in a church with noise going on, you might just miss some of the messages by hammering it home again and again and again. The success of the First Crusade, the remission of sins. You will, by the end of this sermon, you will get it and you will understand why you should do this. He also talks about some practical measures. He says that the Crusaders will be, uh, their lands will be protected when they go away. They won't have to pay interest, that is usury, on the loans that they might take out. And he also warns them against going with fine clothes. He wants them to go in a spiritually pure fashion. So it's a clever, clever piece of writing. Alongside that, we have the letters of Bernard of Clairvaux, the greatest churchman of the 12th century, the leader of the Cistercian order, and a renowned orator. And Eugenius tours around, around Paris and a little bit around Northern Italy, but Bernard really hits the road hard and goes around Flanders and the Rhineland uh, and down Germany into, effectively into modern day Switzerland. And his sermons are legendary. Uh, he's practically mobbed by, by crowds. He has to sneak out at the back of hotel, uh, I could say the back of hotels like a rock star. He has to sneak out the back of where he's staying because he will be mobbed by people who are so enthusiastic to hear him and to be in his presence. But his message is interesting because of course he can't simply repeat what Eugenius has said. And his letters and his sermons are very personal. They're to you, the listener, you must act. This is an urgent time. You must respond to this opportunity that God has given you. And he emphasizes the loss of the Holy Land, the loss of the place sanctified by Christ's blood. He says that the devil is worried and angry and gnashing his teeth at the prospect of Westerners coming out and if you like, setting right his bad work. And he presents this as a chance for Christians that God has given them, this lucky generation, he calls them. He said, God could sort this out, but he's chosen you now to receive 
this one-off chance to make this tremendous achievement in, in setting right this difficulty. So I think he is also creating an expectation, an emotional pressure on his audience that you have this opportunity that you cannot, can you, decline. He also talks in his letter about trying to set right troubles in Western Europe. There's quite a lot of, a lot of violence between different parties and he says you've got to sort that out. He says you've got to not attack Jews, something that plagued the First Crusade. He's very clear that the Jews should not be attacked in the course of seeking money or any kind of spiritual revenge. And he also appeals to the very merchant classes. You who are meant quick to see an opportunity, here is a chance of profit. And he's talking in the sense of spiritual profit rather than earthly profit. So you have these two very, very powerful, persuasive, compelling messages coming across to the people of Western Europe who are primed and ready and enthusiastic about following in the steps of the First Crusaders. Of course, it didn't remotely turn out as they planned.